there we go and i'm also going to share my screen with you so that you can see uh my presentation here we are there we go so you should be able to see that now okay so today's talk is on the villa romana del casale at piazza armenina in sicily so today's fo talk focuses on the roman villa near piazza armenina after extension, extensive restoration, it was fully reopened to the public again in 2016. The mosaic floors cover an area of almost three and a half thousand square meters in some 60 or so rooms. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, it contains some of the finest Roman mosaics in southern Italy and is undoubtedly one of the foremost visitor attractions on the island. So today I'm going to firstly give a little bit of background on what the Romans were doing in Sicily and then I'm going to give you a virtual tour of the villa itself and to try and um, talk about some of the technicalities of the mosaics. So, um, first of all, um, let's just talk a little bit about the Romans in Sicily. We touched on them a couple of weeks ago when we were in Syracuse and we talked about the downfall of Greek Syracuse in 212 BC. So that's the end of the Greeks and the beginning of the Roman period. Um, so it started end of the third century BC and it continued on into the fourth century AD. So um, a period of at least 550 years. Thereafter at the end of course it didn't just um, finish with another invasion. Um, as you'll know of course the Roman Empire split into to the Eastern Roman Empire and Western Roman Empire. And at that time, um, for a time, Sicily was ruled over by the Western Roman Empire from Rome. And then it sort of strange things happened. Um, it fell into being governed by the Eastern Roman Empire. In fact, for a, for a short period, um, one of the emperors of Constantinople even moved his palace to Syracuse for a few years. Um, but notionally, Sicily became Byzantine. Um, but on the grounds, not very much happens, you know, more or less everything continued as normal. Now, um, having said that, um, when Sicily became Roman in 212 BC, it wasn't as if there was a huge invasion of Italic speaking people, Latin speaking people. Um, no, very much uh, life on the ground continued on in the way that it had done under the Greeks. The Romans simply took over the system of governance and taxation. And they used this to, to send the taxes and the proceeds to Rome. So it was a very clever form of, of government. However, there was um, one big change. Um, and that was that uh, the Romans considered Sicily as their breadbasket, as their food source for Rome. And to that end, they deforested Sicily. So previously, Sicily had been thickly forested. Um, the Romans cleared a lot of those forests and created huge estates. These were feudal estates run by a landowner and worked by slaves. Um, these were very often slaves that had been captured in battles, maybe in North Africa or in other parts of the Roman Empire, brought over to Sicily and made to, to work on the land, to, to farm the land, to produce essentially wheat that was then shipped off to Rome to, to, to feed 
um, the capital of the Roman Empire. So um, really between sort of 212 BC and, and the fourth century AD, Sicily was really quite a quiet agricultural backwater. There, there's not a great deal uh, documented about it. Um, exception to that is, is of course the, um, the Punic Wars, the wars with the Carthaginians. These were mainly naval battles and these took place off the coast of Sicily and I'm going to talk, um, talk about these in a couple of weeks time when we talk about uh, the Carthaginians. But in the interior of Sicily, um, more or less life went on, uh, people tilled the land and, and farmed in, in the way that they had done um, even, even under the Greeks. So um, having said that, um, we find ourselves with the, um, the vestiges of this fabulous Roman villa and the slide that I've put up here um, is, a, is a reconstruction of how this villa would have looked. So um, first part of my talk I want to ask ourselves how did this come into being and, and what, was its, what was its purpose and possibly also we need to ask ourselves who lived here. Um, all of these questions are questions that have been hotly debated by academics over the course of the last um, uh, last 50 years really and none, none, nobody has really come up with a, a really conclusive answer. Um, for a long time one of the suggestions was that this was a hunting villa. Um, it was a villa out in the middle of the countryside uh, therefore it was somewhere where a rich Roman would bring his friends and they would go off hunting um, and entertain themselves. Um, the reason for this argument is that many of the mosaic scenes on the floor in the villa are scenes of hunting. However, it seems that it's too big a villa just to have been used um, seasonally for you know mere enjoyment, something like that. Um, another suggestion is that it was actually a holding place for um, animals that were brought into the, uh, well, they were being taken to Rome eventually, but they'd been brought to Italy from all over the Roman Empire, from India, from Africa, Asia, um, and they were kept in the countryside around in, in large pens, so lions, tigers, elephants, and so on. And then they were shipped off to, uh, to Rome for gladiatorial games as necessary. This is possible. Um, again, the um, argument for this is that there are scenes in the mosaics depicting exactly this activity. But um, one does have to ask oneself why, um, uh, why they would bring the animals all this way to a remote corner of Sicily um, and just leave them there for <laughs> if they were really destined to go to Rome. Um, unfortunately we don't have any sort of written documentary evidence as to who um, owned the villa and tantalizingly some of the um, possible evidence that we could have in it as in the, the mosaics in the floor and possibly some of the um, decorations on the wall have been damaged at precisely the points that, that could actually give us the, the crucial clues. So we don't have any certain evidence, but we do have a few pointers. Um, let's go to the question of why it was built here in the middle of, of, of nowhere or seemingly nowhere. Um, and for that, let's, let's have a look at, at a map of Sicily. Um, if you remember last week, we talked about how the Greeks tended to settle around the shores of Sicily. Their means of navigation was by ship. 
The Romans, um, probably because they had cleared the forest and created these huge um, feudal estates, needed to get around in the interior. And we do have Roman roads crisscrossing Sicily. Um, in fact, it's quite bizarre. Sometimes you're walking through the mountains. I can think of one um, example in the Madonia, for example, um, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and suddenly you come across the remains of a Roman road. And you, you wonder, where is it going to? Where is it coming from? And <clears throat> there was a Roman route that crossed between Catania and Agrigento. You can see um, this red route on the map here. This would have been the most direct route for the Romans to get between those two cities. And it passed through these four feudal lands. Um, and we do have these documented. And in fact, Philosophiana is, lo and behold, the Villa del Casale. So um, we know that it was on the route between Catania and Agrigento. So it wasn't quite the remote place that um, we might think of it as, as being. Um, as far as dating the villa, we think that, or we, we know really, um, that it was built on the site of a, an early Roman rustic villa, probably dating from the first century AD. Um, we don't have very many archaeological remains of that left. But the remains of what we do have very certainly date from the beginning of the fourth century AD. So uh, sort of between 300 and 310 AD. How do we know that? Well, there are some clues in the mosaics and um, I'll come to those in the course of the lecture. In that case then, the villa dates from near the end of the Roman occupation of, of Sicily. So it's quite, it's a late Roman villa, if you like. Um, it certainly wasn't built all in one go, and it evolved over the period, we think, of about 150 years. In other words, it must have had more than one owner, more than one occupier. Um, just looking at the plan of it, you can see that it was built on three different axes. So the main part is built around this courtyard here. And then we have another part here, which is built on a different axis. And then another part here. Um, the reason for these three different axes, uh, partly they were built at different times, partly also the lie of the land, you can't quite see from this diagram, but to the right of this drawing are the hills, and to the left of this drawing is a river. So the land slopes down from the right down towards the left. So um, the first part of the villa would have been built, as I say, around this courtyard, what we call a peristyle. Um, there would have been an entrance here and some utility rooms here, storage rooms, kitchens, and so forth. Living quarters at the back here and here. Um, a large corridor running the whole length, joining um, the two sections of the living quarters. Some um, sort of halls, really. They could have been used as meeting rooms or possibly in dining halls. And then the most important room was, was this hall here, this would have been a reception hall, um, called a basilica. And I'm going to come back to that later at the very end of the talk because um, it, it's important, but I'll leave that for the time being. So that would have been the main body of the villa for much of the time. However, as you'll all appreciate, um, very important to Roman culture was um, what the Romans said, uh, the acronym was SPA, 
salute per acqua, health through water, was the baths. And they built a bath complex um, just to the west of the main complex here. Um, slightly downhill, this meant that the wastewater would run into the river rather than through the villa, and it was served by an aqueduct that came off the hills here. Um, I'm not going to talk terribly much about the baths today, unfortunately because I don't have the best photographs, but um, just very briefly here, um, as you'll know, the um, taking a bath in Roman times uh, tended to take the whole of an afternoon or a morning, several hours at least, and involved moving through different stages of the bath. So um, we had the hot part of the baths down here, the caldarium as it's called, and the water was heated by furnaces just off to the left here. Um, water, hot water pumped underneath a, a hypercoarse, heated the water and made the hot steamy room. Then a tepidarium here, tepid water, a massage room here, and a frigidarium here, the cold water in this part here. Um, however, this leads on to um, the next stage of building because um, up to a certain point, the villa had obviously been a private residence. Um, but at some stage, uh, it began to take on a public function. And at that time, this building here was built. Um, so as you can see, it had a separate entrance. And this building here, which um, unfortunately is the part of the villa that we haven't been able to, to get access to for at, last, at least 10 years, um, it's called the Triclinium, it was a huge dining hall, was built precisely so that visitors could come through a separate entrance and the master could entertain them in a banquet um, without um, them actually coming into the main body of the villa. And the same thing with this very ceremonial grand entrance here, um, which allowed them to come into um, a small peristyle here and get access to the baths through another entrance here. So the baths began to take on a public function. Um, now this was interesting because prior to this, um, the baths had been private and therefore they had been, the bathing had been, we know this, promiscuous, mixed sex bathing. Um, and we know that because of the, the layout of the baths and the way that the, cha the changing area was organized. But at some stage, um, obviously when it was open to the public, they would have had segregated bathing and um, the layout of the, the, the baths was changed subsequently. Um, but as I say, unfortunately, I don't have the best photographs of the, mos of the um, mosaics in the bath. So the main body of the talk is going to be on, on, on the mosaics in, in the rest of the hall today. Um, so just before we move on to looking at some of the floors and the mosaics, um, the question that we have to, have to answer is what happened to this villa? Well, um, in the 5th century AD, it was still inhabited, to all, as far as we believe, and a kind of farming community grew up around it. And in fact, that's where we get the name Casale from. Casale just means a big farming hamlet in, in, in Sicilian. So Villa del Casale is the villa of the um, farming hamlet. But then at some time in the early medieval period, there was a huge landslide. So the um, high land to the right of the villa obviously gave way and came down the hill and completely submerged the, the villa. Um, the inhabitants that survived went off and founded the city of Piazza Menina. But this was all to our good fortune really because it buried the mosaics 
under a layer of silt and mud, and there they remained until, really until the 19th century, um, which were the first excavations, and then the first serious excavations were not until the 20th century um, by the great Sicilian archaeologist Paolo Orsi. Unfortunately, it's continued to suffer from subsidence and um, landslides and so on and so forth. Um, and throughout much of the 20th century, it was continuously closed and shut down and so forth. Um, underwent, as I said, extensive renovation um, in about 10 years ago, and then uh, five years ago, it was fully reopened again to, to the public. Um, so, without any more ado, let's go and have a look at some of the uh, fabulous mosaics, which are really the reason why we, we come to visit the Fibra. Um, just before we do, one slide here to show you the exterior of the villa, how it looks today. Um, it's the, the way that it's been done up, you'll see the very obvious modern um, extension that's been built up here. This is to give you an idea of the dimensions of the villa in Roman times. This building here at the back is the Basilica. This is the tallest building, um, but everything else would be single story. Um, I mean, the Basilica, of course, also single story, but much higher. Um, everything else that you see around here is, is original. Um, the columns here, these have been put back up, but they are, they are original. But it gives you some idea of the of the dimensions of the villa. And a tour of the villa um, invariably involves um, going inside here and then you, you go up onto a, a walkway and it's a one-way walk around looking down on the mosaics. So as a consequence, it's quite difficult sometimes to get a good photograph of the mosaic because you're sometimes at a bit of a strange angle but bear with me for this. So let's have a look at the mosaics. So um, the mosaics are divided into roughly two different types. Um, the geometric designs, such as these ones here, and ones I'll show you in a moment, which are figurative designs. In other words, designs showing depicting people or animals or maybe a battle or ships or something like that. And very, very loosely speaking, um, just exactly in the same way as the way we deck out our, our houses today, um, just as we put the finest carpets in our living room to show off to our visitors, and we put the sort of scruffy old rugs somewhere up in the um, study room. It was exactly the same thing here. So the rooms of lesser importance um, tended to have um, mosaics of geometric designs. So it's not to say that they weren't very fine designs, very fine mosaics like this one here, but they weren't the finest figurative mosaics that we'll go and um, I'll show you in a short while. Um, but nevertheless, even though these were what we call geometric, notice the three-dimensional um, effect that the Romans managed to recreate um, using the two-dimensional um, surface. And they did that by, as you can see, using different shades of um, mosaic tessera different stones. We'll come to the technique of making the mosaics in, in a moment. Um, and notice the different shading that they, they, they got in here, different light and shade, and also the very elaborate shapes that they created, some nice floral patterns as well. So in terms of the villa, this, this mosaic is a very simple design. Uh, but to us, nevertheless, it, it still looks very beautiful. Um, so I said I'd mention a little bit the technique of making the mosaics. So the mosaics 
were made from what we call little tessera. These are these tiny little pieces here of stone. Now, tessera is an Italian word, or you know, of course it comes from Latin, um, and it just means tile. Um, tile, of course, can be made of anything, but these were made of stone. Um, in due course, of course, quite possible to make mosaics using glass or ceramics or, or, or any other material you cared for, but all of the ones in the Villa del Casale were made out of local marble that was found around Sicily. Um, so the whites, the greys, the reds, different browns, um, we also have greens and yellows and so forth. Um, these were the kind of palette of colours that the mosaicists employed. Um, the size of each of these tessera is something like, something like the size of your thumbnail. Um, obviously the finer work um, used smaller little pieces and they were basically stuck in place in, into a cement and, and grouted. It was as simple as, as that. Um, the work was done by craftsmen from, we think, from North Africa. Um, and the reason why we think that is that they are very similar in design to the mosaics that we tend to see in, for example, um, Tunis. So we can imagine large bodies of craftsmen having been brought over from um, what is now modern day Tunisia to have worked on this um, villa. We see different stylistic um, uh, or different styles used throughout the villa as well, so we can identify maybe different teams, different craftsmen, and so on and so forth. Um, moving on a little bit, so this lovely, uh, another beautiful ge geometric design here on the floor. Um, we're going to talk mainly about the mosaics today, but let's not forget that um, when the villa was inhabited, it would also had beautiful um, frescoes painted on the walls. Those of you who have been to some of the Roman villas in Campania, or Plantis, um, not to mention, of course, Pompeii, will have seen this kind of thing. Unfortunately, in the Villa del Casale, although once upon a time it would have been decorated like this, um, many of them, because of the landslide, because the villa was covered under mud for many, many centuries, Unfortunately, these have been badly damaged. These ones that we can see here are just about the best examples that we, we have. Um, some more geometric designs here, just to show you. Uh, different palette of colors here, some yellows, different plaits. And we also see some representation of, of fruits, some figs, for example, um, melons, um, some pears, and so forth. Um, let's just go back to our uh, plan of the villa. And I said earlier that it was mainly um, organized around what we call this peristyle. Peristyle simply being um, a courtyard, a fountain in the middle, and a colonnade around it, affording uh, alternately shade or sunshine, depending on where you were, meaning that you could walk around the peristyle at different times of day and stay in the cool or the sunshine out of the rain just as you as you wished. And the beautiful mosaic on the floor of this peristyle is this one here. Um, now these are, so again we've got geometric designs um, divided into these beautiful there's these squares with roundels in the middle. In the corners, some birds and vine leaves. And in the center of each roundel is an animal. Now, um, these animals are from all over the Roman world. So we have, certainly, we, they, these weren't found wild in Sicily. So we have tigers, we have lions, hippopotami, um, I think there's a rhinoceros somewhere, um, and, and so forth. All of these can be identified. Um, and also some slightly mythical 
beast as well, which we probably can't quite identify. Um, so this was, this was the beautiful uh, colonnade that welcomed visitors. They would have come into the villa, uh, the entrance was here, and to get to the basilica, they would have had to have walked around it here. Um, just moving indoors a little bit now, um, so into one of the um, meeting rooms here is a room that was called the the room of the small hunt. Um, that's to contrast it with the room of the great hunt, but which we'll come to in a, in a moment. Um, this is one of my favourite rooms. This um, we'll talk about it for a few moments. Um, a few interesting points to mention here. First of all, very obviously, lots of scenes of hunting. Um, I've got some photos of some details here, so we'll go and look at the details in a moment, but very loosely, uh, you might be able to make out here hunting with um, chasing animals into a net. Um, we've got hunting with falcons here, uh, hunting with spears here, hunting wild boar. We've got scenes of making barbecues here um, and so forth. Um, but one of the curious things that I always think about this um, scene is if you look in the middle here, can you see this? Look, it's, it's been, I don't know whether it's been repaired or whether um, they just had another idea and sort of put a different scene in the middle. But this repair, or whatever it is, is contemporary to Roman times. It's contemporary with the rest of the mosaic. So whether or not it suffered damage or they simply changed their idea, I don't know. Um, but you see this kind of thing quite a lot throughout the villa. Um, and this lends substance to, to what I was saying earlier on, that um, the, we think of these mosaics, mosaics as extraordinarily rich floor coverings, and to a certain extent they were, but that wasn't to stop the owner of just changing them just in the same way that we would change a carpet. Oh, I don't like that design anymore. Um, let's get rid of that, go to the shops and get a new rug and put that down. It did very much seem to function like that. Um, let's go and have a look at this detail here, this, this little corner here, which I rather like. So this, again, they've caught their prey. I don't know what it is. They're cooking maybe a rabbit or a grouse or, I don't know, a partridge, whatever else that they've caught. But so they're enjoying the, the barbecue. But look, the smoke is rising. And look where the smoke is going. This goes back to what we were saying last week, um, the Greeks making the sacrifice to the gods. The Romans did a similar, th similar thing. They made, made a thanksgiving to their god. And if you look carefully, this is the goddess Diana. You can see her bow in her hand, and you can't quite make it here, but she also had a quiver of arrows. So as well as making a barbecue of what they cooked, they are thanking the goddess Diana for the success in their hunting. Another lovely detail um, which we can't miss is this one here. This is one of the most famous scenes in the whole of the, the, the villa. Um, hunting the wild boar, uh, with the spear here. But look, you can see the wild boar has attacked this poor chap. He's got a gash in his leg. Blood is pouring from it. Um, but just in time, his friend rushes with the spear. You can see how the spear has these barbs, because otherwise this is how they hunted the boar. The boar charged at them and then they held out the spear. And with any luck, the spear would go into the boar and these barbs would stop the the, the spear going right the way through, and then the dogs were following through, um, taking a gash out of the out of the boar. So, all terribly bloodthirsty, um, but uh, nevertheless, this was the kind of things that the Romans really relished in. 
Another lovely room here. This is a room of, we don't know the function of this room, but probably it would have been a dining room or something like that. Uh, lovely room of fishing, um, boats here, um, beautiful villa, <coughs> excuse me, uh, villa, um, very reminiscent of the kind of villas that you've got in Campania around Naples here. Uh, if we look at the detail here, look, we can identify that these are cupids fishing. You can see their little wings here. Um, and notice also curious detail here. They have this little um, V sign on the forehead. We think <coughs> that this was a um, kind of signature of the mosaicist or, or, or of the artist or of the craftsman. Um, another lovely thing is this design here. Um, look how they've recreated three dimensions on the side of the boat using just shading of different coloured um, tessera. We can identify the fish. Look here we've got a, um, a jellyfish here, dolphins um, and so forth. Um, another lovely room is this one here. Um, this is one of the master's bedrooms here. Um, small room measuring uh, three meters square. And it depicts the story of Ulysses. You'll remember Ulysses, he was shipwrecked um, off the coast of Sicily and he was captured by the Cyclops uh, Polyphemus and he was held captive inside a cave. And you'll remember the story, clever Ulysses, he gave wine to the Cyclops to make him drunk and then he was going to um, blind him with a spear and then escape from the cave by hiding underneath the sheep as the Cyclops let the sheep out to graze. Um, beautiful scene this and still in very very good state of repair. Um, just one thing to mention if you look carefully this has been pointed out you'll notice that the Cyclops actually has three eyes not one. Um, the suggestion here is possibly that actually this is a, just a scene of actors acting out a play and that this is really an awning um, strung up between some trees in a forest and they are acting out the play of Ulysses. It's all quite possible but a lovely lovely scene there. Another scene in the master, this is the master's bedroom here, um, this is in the master's bedroom itself we think uh, whether this is the master's wife or his mistress, we don't know. It's left to our imagination. Um, this is one of the most famous um, mosaics. You, you see it on many of the books, guidebooks around, around Sicily. Um, one, I'm jumping around here, so we're not, we're not doing the tour in the way that we do it would do it if we're walking around the villa but I'm taking advantage of the fact that we can jump, jump around to show you if you like the highlights of some of the mosaics. Um, this here is the entrance to the bath and this lady here is obviously somebody very important quite possibly the wife of the owner of the, the villa we can't identify her we don't know her name um, but we can identify um, that she is extremely important, partly by the colour of her robes. Um, not quite purple, regal purple, but almost possibly. Um, beautiful necklace and her hair on her head. Um, incidentally, the, the style of these clothes are, are typical of the late Roman period, the early 4th century AD. So again, lending further weight and evidence to um, the, 
at the time when the villa was built. She's surrounded by her ladies in waiting, possibly carrying her, uh, her jewelry box or maybe her change of clothing or whatever else as she goes into, into the bath. Um, so what you have to imagine is that just under here is a doorway. You step through that doorway into this lovely corridor here. Unfortunately, this is not a great photo. It doesn't really do justice to the subject, but um, no photo does. It's impossible unless you're a kind of helicopter or something. It's impossible to get a great photo of this. But this is um, a really truly fantastic mosaic, this one, because this, if you, if you look, you can recognize um, an obelisk in the middle um, and you can recognize chariots. Here's one, uh, there's another one here, another one here. This is the Circus Maximus in Rome. It is a circus race and in fact um, with more detail we can actually identify the, the four different teams, the red team, the white team, the blue team and the green, te green team. Um, and it's all terribly dramatic. This chariot here is, is actually having an accident. Um, a wheel is falling off and it's going to crash, I think. So a really super mosaic, mosaic that, uh, but difficult to get a great photo. Um, let's just go back to the plan of the villa to get our bearings. Um, the, this room here, which kind of joins the uh, north and the south wing of the villa together um, is called the Corridor of the Great Hunt. It is neither a corridor nor does it display the Great Hunt, <laughs> but that's what it's always been called and it's, it's what it's known. And this is the interior of it here. Again, no photo does it justice. Unfortunately, it's absolutely impossible to, to get a photo that shows all of it. Unfortunately, it's suffered from subsidence over the years, but nevertheless, it's been nicely uh, repaired to the best of our ability. Um, this here, this ship, I'm going to show you in the next photo. Now, the next photo, very obviously has been photoshopped. These are not the colours that you see when you go to visit the villa. Incidentally, I should talk about the colours. The, 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 um, it's very hard to get good photographs of the mosaics because inevitably they, they are open to the elements, they, uh, dust settles on them and when we go to visit them they tend to have a sort of slightly dusty colour to them. Um, when they do the photo, photos for the guidebooks, they, they wet the, um, the, the stones of the mosaic and of course it, gives, it makes them shine, it gives them the beautiful colour. Um, but this photo, the one that we're looking at here, it's not just that. This has actually um, been photoshopped um, as well. Um, further thing to that, of course, to bear in mind is that um, because the, the tessera of the mosaics are stone, the stone has not faded in any way. So what we are looking at is exactly what the Romans looked at. The colour has not changed in any way since uh, the 4th century AD, so 1600 years ago. Anyway, so what does this depict? Um, as I said, it's called the Corridor of the Great Hunt. It's not really a hunt at all. Um, it is a um, traffic of animals from all over the Roman Empire. So from Africa, from Asia, from India, we can identify Indian elephants, we can identify rhinoceri. Um, you can see here some um, ostriches, um, some antelopes, and they are being brought onto ships that are what you have to imagine here, it's all very clever because um, they're being brought onto the ship in Africa 
and being taken off the ship at Rome and taken off to, uh, for the gladiatorial games for, for the animals to face uh, battle with the gladiators. Um, we can also identify um, uh, faces from all over the Roman world. So um, we have uh, Asian physiologies as well as African faces as well as uh, Roman, <laughs> Roman faces as well. And of course, different costumes uh, we can identify. Um, one of the beautiful uh, details of this corridor is this gentleman here. Now, this chap has been identified as the Emperor Maximian. Um, if we are correct about that, Maximian reigned from 286 to 305 uh, AD, and therefore this also helps us to date the villa. At one time it was suggested that he was the owner of the villa, um, but I don't, I, I, mean, I think if he had been the owner we would have had some um, documentary evidence which we don't have, so I think it's just a portrait. But nevertheless you can see him um, very regal here, surrounded by his two bodyguards. Um, just the last couple of slides here, um, we really can't visit the um, Roman villa without visiting this room here. Um, this is the one that everybody wants to see. They always ask, where are the bikini girls? Where are the bikini girls? Here they are. Um, so uh, what does it depict? So um, no, they are not at the beach sunbathing. They are exercising. And this room is possibly the, what we call the palestra. Palestra in Italian or in Latin simply means the gym, the gymnasium. And we think that it is some kind of competition. We can identify different sports uh, going on here. So obviously running, um, discus throwing here. Um, this girl has got some dumbbells, uh, some girls playing ball, volleyball, something like that. But this is interesting here. This is, this is what makes us think it is a competition because this girl is evidently the winner. She is holding the palm that has been given to her by this lady here. And it looks like uh, this girl here is also about to receive a prize. Also with some laurel, um, uh, a laurel head, headdress or, or something like, like that. Um, so beautiful mosaic, lovely. Um, depiction of, of motion and, and really very, um, very advanced. I mean, if you, if you think what you know, they're actually portraying and the medium that they are using to portray it. Um, but the other thing to point out here is evident, further evidence that, similar to what I pointed out before. Because if you look in the top left-hand corner, you can see that this is the remains of a previous floor. So what has happened here is that um, at some stage in the history of the villa, the owner uh, decided that they were fed up of this geometric mosaic here. Let's have something much more dynamic. Let's put down a mosaic with these fantastic um, sports girls. And they simply put down <laughs> a new floor and put down some new mosaics. Um, at some point then it was damaged and revealed the uh, previous mosaic underneath here. And very, very finally, let's go to this building here, the grand building at the back of the villa, the building which is called the Basilica. Now, um, Basilica doesn't mean that it was a church. Um, this was the beginning of the fourth century before the Roman Empire had converted to Christianity. Um, 
it comes from Greek word basileus, just meaning ruler. Um, and this was the room in which the owner of the villa would have um, accepted his guests. So they would have come in through the entrance here, around the courtyard and into the basilica. And the basilica is by far the largest room of the whole villa. And yet it doesn't have any mosaics on the floor. This is, this is the floor of the basilica. And visitors are very often surprised by this. This is very, very often where we end our visit. And they say, oh, what a, what a disappointment. You know, I mean, we've seen all these lovely mosaics and now we come and see the most important room of the villa and it doesn't have mosaics. Well, this is something quite curious because, um, as I said to, to us, you know, the, the, um, the mosaics were made out of local stone, local to Sicily, of course, local marbles. But the basilica was floored with pieces of stone sourced from all over the Roman Empire. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not enough of a geologist to be able to identify <laughs> all of these kind of stones, but these are absolutely the precious jewels. And any visitor coming to visit the, the owner of the villa would have been absolutely flabbergasted and massively impressed by the stone um, on the floor of this basilica. Probably also it would have been tiled around the exterior as well. Unfortunately, of course, because it was so precious, um, a lot of this has just been taken away. So, um, this, you know, this is um, interesting, really, in, in the sense that um, appreciation has changed over the course of time. We come to the villa today to admire the mosaics. Um, in Roman times, it would have been quite uh, something quite uh, different. Okay, so I think I've used up my time. I've gone slightly over time, but I can unmute you. I can <coughs> stop the share. And if you would like to turn on your microphones, if anybody would like to ask a question, I think we have uh, five or 10 minutes left at the end for, for questions. So, Put your hand up, a shout, shout out to anybody who I'd, wants I'd to. like to ask a question. Georgina, Georgina, oh, yes, you have a question. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit confused. You said that they were feudal estates but worked by slaves. Can you explain how that was <coughs> created? Yes, yes, just... yes, 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 yes. Um, absolutely. So um, it was feudal in, in terms of the, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I didn't make that very, very clear. So um, it was in the system of ownership. So the owner of the estate would, would have been uh, probably a landlord, a senator or somebody um, important in Rome, somebody who didn't live in Sicily itself. Um, but the, the tenant, if you like, of the land would have been somebody that was on the land themselves. And they in turn would have been the ones who um, worked the slaves and got the slaves to produce the, the corn and so forth. So, sorry, I didn't make that clear, but hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody you else? How many, people, how many people lived in this facility? It looked, I was surprised by the size of it, it was huge. Absolutely, yes, and a very, very good question. Um, we don't know the exact answer to that question. Um, and probably the answer varied from, from time to time. But um, it is a long time. Megan, I have to come back to you. I'm, I'm listening to a lecture. Uh, that people just no, came it's, to. I'll only be five or ten minutes. Wanted to stay in okay. yeah, um, okay. you know, for a short period. But now we think, um, precisely because of, because of the size of it, it was definitely inhabited all year round. Um, we can't give in exact numbers, but certainly the numbers would be in their hundreds. I mean, you know, the, 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 um, the owner and his family would probably make up uh, 
couple of dozen, if not three or four dozen visitors, and then all of the servants and then all of the other people just to uh, administer and to, to maintain the place. So it's at least several hundred, probably. Anybody else? Yes, somebody's got their hand up. Ah, oh, Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hello, yes, David. Nice to see you. A long you. time since we've met. It is. Yes, lovely to see you. <laughs> Thank you. What I wanted to know was, is there much difference in the dimension of the tessera, or tesserae, in the various um, mosaics? Because we've oh. seen ones in Italy, which are sometimes very, very small, very fine. Yes, yes. What a good question. And nobody's ever asked that before. <laughs> um, the, it did vary as I said, but it wasn't a huge yeah. variance. Um, um, yeah. More or less, they were nearly all the size of my thumbnail. Um, I know what you're alluding to, because if you go to, for example, the museum in Naples, mm -hmm. uh, the archaeological museum, you see some tiny, tiny tesserae that are, and, and to look at the mosaic, you wouldn't believe it's a mosaic, you would think it's a painting, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, but the, um, the mosaics in the Villa del Casale are not quite of, of that quality. No, they are. And I think it's because they were designed to, to be on, on the floor. So more or less, you know, they varied, but not quite as hugely as, as I think you, you've probably seen elsewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Not at all. Anybody else? Who else do we have? Alan, Alan, you've got a question, yes? Ah, but you, you've got your oh, yeah. mute on, Alan. You'll need to unmute yourself. Um, um, right, now, okay, I think was, we can hear you now. Yes, speak up. Were there other art forms uh, uncovered when the restoration was done? Statuary, and I mean, I don't know about paintings, but was the entire artistic output in the mosaics, do you think? Uh, what a good question. No, not, not, not entirely, no. Um, um, so as I said, uh, there were some frescoes on the wall, but the other thing that has been found in the villa, which I didn't mention, um, are of course statues. Mm. Um, and one of the things that was found was a beautiful statue of Apollo. Now, um, there is a beautiful music room in the villa um, with mosaics on the floor um, of Orpheus, Orpheus serenading Apollo. Of course, Apollo was the god of music. However, unfortunately, of course, statues are quite um, movable. And if there were other statues, I think they have disappeared over the course of time and people have taken them. So the other art forms, unfortunately, have, have disappeared. We don't really have those at all. Damien. Yes, hello. Oh, Terry, yes. Terry, yes. Yeah, Sue, in fact. Sue, yes, um, yes. I just wanted to go back to the mosaics. Um, the people who actually laid the mosaics, would they have been slaves or would they have been paid craftsmen for the work that they did? Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, they weren't slaves. Um, in contrast to, for example, the people who worked on the land and so forth. No, very definitely they would have been craftsmen. The skill of their workmanship is just, is just too good for it to have, been, um, for the, to have been slaves. Probably they would have been teams of craftsmen, as I said, probably brought over from North Africa to do this. And then, um, you know, they would have moved from villa to villa working on, on, on different, um, different floors. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is that this isn't the only Roman villa in, in Sicily. There are others. There's a nice one in Marsala. Uh, there's one down near Noto. And there's one in a place called Patti uh, near to Milan, so on the north coast. So there are other Roman villas. And these teams of craftsmen would have had a lot of work moving around, um, right. making the mosaics and probably going around repairing the mosaics. I and mean, it was a bit like, you know, being a plumber or something today. Uh, there was always work for you. 
Anybody else? I think we've got time for a couple more questions. If yeah. Kate, Kate, have you got a question? Kate, you'll need to unmute yourself. You're, Sorry, you're muted through. still. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, it, was there accommodation for these people or did they have to sort of bring their own sort of tents as it were or, you know? Um, <laughs> yes, that? yes, absolutely. Um, probably uh, a lot of, there would, have, there would have been accommodation in the but sense in the form of wooden okay. huts and of course we, we've lost all of that okay. now. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, um, there is a recent excavation just to the west of the villa, which has uncovered some um, earlier dwellings um, going back at least to the Byzantine times. So um, there would have been other, other, you know, other accommodation for them as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Damien. Anybody else? I can ask a question. Hazel, yes, of course you can ask a question. Yes, how nice to see you. Yes. Well, when we were there seven years ago, 2013, with you, it was called the Piazza Amarina. And that's what I have a postcard of. So now I have to change all my records <laughs> to show this different name, which is really annoying. And, but it, uh, I do remember that our guide, his name was uh, Onofrio, and he was it, very it dramatic. Was awful, he kept, yes, yes. He kept, kept hurrying us through, and then he threw water on one of the mosaics to show us how brilliant it was. So it was a very, very nice tour, but very limited. When I see what you now they've now uncovered, it's really amazing. Well, yes, yes, and I remember that visit because, unfortunately, you, and Hazel, you're going to have to come back. That's the only thing. Yeah, for I'm going to have to come back. That was before the restorations, and we didn't manage to see all the villa, but. Um, Yes, you, you are absolutely right. Um, so uh, after the villa was completely buried by the landslide, the people of the villa moved up the valley and they founded the town of Piazza Armenina. Right. So you're quite right. Um, it is known by both names. So you don't need to go and change all the names in your, <laughs> in your, in your photo diary. Um, it's known as the Villa of Piazza Arminina, but I think more correctly, it's called the Villa del Casale. Um, and yes, you're quite right about Onofrio um, throwing water down on the tiles and, and showing very dramatic. How, how the colors came up. Yeah. One last question. Anybody? Anybody got a last question? I think Hazel, David you've got a, hey, the other no, Hazel. Have David, you got a question? David had one. I thought. Day. Oh, David. David. Yes. Where is David? I can't see oh, you. Yeah, David. Speak up, David. No, I haven't got any. No, I. Was oh, you haven't got a question. Oh, David. <laughs> I, was going, I was going to ask about the um, whether the craftsmen were itinerant, um, but um, you answered. You've already answered yes. that. Yes, yeah. they, they would definitely have been, yeah. definitely have been itinerants, yeah. 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 And well respected. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Well paid. <laughs> and da Damien, can I ask another hey. question? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, it's, it's probably not part of your lecture tour, but I'm interested in the clothing that the girls are wearing, um, because they look <laughs> like they should have elastic in them, and I don't know that the Romans invented elastic, and they hadn't got lycra, and they stay up. <laughs> Kate, you are you are getting into territory that is beyond my knowledge. <laughs> I thought it might be, but it's interesting. It's interesting. I really don't know um, is the answer to that. Um, I'm sure somebody else on this talk is better qualified. I must find out now, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, just have to I don't know, but it's a very interesting subject, and um, <laughs> I will go away and look up. <laughs> Yes. All right, well, we have gone a little bit over time, um, so thank you for your, your patience and thank you, you for joining us. Uh, thank, <laughs> you. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you very thank much, Damien, thank, um, thank you. Come and join us next week. Next week's tour, uh, talk, is on, what is he doing? It is on the Normans in oh. Palermo. So uh, we will see more mosaics next week. But very different mosaics, I can assure you, uh, but some equally lovely buildings. So um, yeah, keep in touch, have a nice week, enjoy your evening or your afternoon wherever you are, and 
See you next time. Bye. 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 B